Thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you, Dr. Kim, for inviting us. Um, today, I'm going to talk about, well, it was there a minute ago, war, family, international arts, but I um, might also like to add serendipity, because our story is a story of serendipity. My favorite word in the English language is serendipitous, not only because it feels like whipped cream on the tongue, but because it seems to be what has led our, our family into this, along this wonderful journey into this exciting arena of the arts. It all started, the serendipity, in 1999. A little girl, um, was out to look in the harmaton. That's the wind that blows in from the Sahara. She went out in that wind to look for her father. She knew he had been killed, but she thought she heard his voice in the whistling wind. So she walked to the gate of the orphanage where she was living, and um, she was a very tiny little thing. She put her head through the rails, and at that very moment, serendipitously, a ballet magazine blew down the, ro the dusty road and slapped her in the face, literally slapped her in the face. Now, any ordinary child might throw this very aged, dirty magazine away, but this little girl was very curious and she believed in seeking opportunities where she could get it because so far she had not had much opportunity. She had been born spotted with vitiligo. She, her, mother, her father had been killed by rebels. Her mother had died of starvation. And her uncle had thought she was not marriageable, that he would never get a bridal price for her. So he didn't want to spend the money feeding her. So she had not much good fortune, but she looked for it everywhere. And she gathered that magazine up, and her curiosity led her to look at it. And there on the front page was, to her, her secret to happiness. There was a picture of a ballerina in a pink tutu, pink point shoes, in a tiara, she was dancing on point, and Michaela was so impressed, well, Michaela, who was then Mibinti Bangura, was so impressed by this happy woman that she was determined she would be happy just like her. She had no idea what she was doing, but she asked her teacher, the woman who volunteered at the orphanage once a week, she asked her, what is this woman doing? I want to be like her. And she learned that this woman was a ballerina. So Michaela practiced standing on her toes and dancing around the orphanage grounds and in the dirt, sure that she would someday become a ballerina. And I would think that her chances were second to none. In 1999, the very same time, the very same month that Michaela found this magazine, we had a snow day, and I was in law school, and we never have off. Um, Rutgers Law was open every day, no matter what, but this particular day, enough professors could not get in that they called a snow day, and I left. I was ready to leave the house. I went up outside, cleaned my car off, but then I had to go back inside because my mittens were saturated. And I dropped the mittens next to my computer and noticed an email message from the school telling us that classes were canceled. I said, whoa, you know, I just had final exams. I had not had a moment to rest in months. So I sat down with a second cup of coffee, a luxury that I had not enjoyed the entire time I was in law school, and I pulled the newspaper towards me. I had only looked at headlines for the previous several months. I'd been so busy with law school. 
This time I decided I was going to read the magazine. I was going to enjoy the luxury of a morning off of school. And when I looked at this magazine, I turned to page six. I still remember the page. And there was an article about a war in Sierra Leone. And I thought to myself, whoa, is there a war in Sierra Leone? Where have I been? And it, I've read the article and noticed that it was the first article they mentioned. This was their first article about the war in Sierra Leone. And I read that hundreds of thousands of children were injured or orphaned. Half a million people had been displaced. The rebels in Sierra Leone were amputating hands, legs, arms, decapitating people. And I was horrified, and I was especially horrified by the picture of this little starving orphan. Now, at the same time that I was in law school, I was preparing for a deposition. I had lost two little boys with hemophilia. During the 80s, the blood product called Factor 8 that was used to treat hemophiliacs had been manufactured from the plasma of thousands of donors. And this plasma became contaminated with HIV. 10,000 US hemophiliacs, most of them young men, had been infected with HIV, including my three youngest sons. I had lost two of the boys. And um, we had filed wrongful death lawsuits on their behalf. And we knew we would be getting a settlement. But my husband and I often said, What's the point? That's not going to return our sons to us. What do we want to do with this money? And at that very moment, I thought, well, it wasn't going to be a large settlement because wrongful death lawsuits um, on behalf of children are usually small because as my law school professor said, you never know if the child is going to grow up to find a cure for cancer or be a serial killer. So I said, what am I going to do with this small money that would help these people in Sierra Leone? I certainly couldn't save all the ch children in that nation. But maybe I could save one child. So I went to the computer and instantly looked up orphans in Sierra Leone and learned that there, there were two um, dozen children walking across the mountains between Sierra Leone and Guinea. And they needed a home, ultimately, because it wasn't safe in the refugee camp in Guinea. The, the rebels from Sierra Leone would often cross the border and snatch the unaccompanied children. So I decided my husband and I would certainly like to adopt. So I called the agency without speaking to my husband and asked them, if they had a, a child for me, I preferred a girl because I had just lost three boys and I didn't want a child to grow up in their shadow. And they said, oh, we have a whole bunch of girls. Um, the families, when they abandon their children, they often abandon their daughters and save their sons. So we have more than two dozen girls. And I, they said, take a pick. They knew I had previously adopted because I told them then. And they said, take a pick, look at the pictures, choose a child. And I went online and I chose the first child I saw. Her name was Mabinti Suma. And this is Mia. Um, I knew nothing about her other than that she had a cheery smile in the picture. She could count to 20 in English. And I thought, well, for a four-year-old who doesn't speak English, that's pretty good. I'll take my chances on Mabinti Suma. I printed up her picture, and that night at dinner, I said to my husband, you know what we need in our life? And he says, what? I said, we need a four-year-old girl. He said, wait a minute, we, we've just raised five boys. I said, but we've lost two of them, and Teddy, another one of our sons, is sick. He was a hemophiliac with AIDS. I said, what are you going to do when Teddy dies? Our two oldest boys are adults. They're out of the house. How are you going to face every day? And um, 
he said, all right, tell me, I, he said, I know what you're like. Tell me our daughter's name and show me a picture of her because I'm sure you've printed one up. And sure enough, I whisked out a picture of Mia and that was it. Mia was our daughter from that second on. But two weeks later, I got a call from the adoption agency and they said to me, um, Mrs. D. Prince, now is your daughter Mabinti Suma or Mabinti Bangura? Now, I couldn't imagine what kind of agency I was dealing with if, if they didn't know which child was mine. So I said, Mabinti Suma. They said, oh. I said, okay, well, tell me about Mabinti Bangura. Oh, they said, well, we've just presented her to 12 families, and they have all rejected her. I said, how terrible could this kid be that 12 families are going to reject her? They said, well, she's spotted. I said, well, I've just raised three boys with hemophilia, who, two of whom have died of AIDS. And frankly, I don't think spots compare with AIDS. So we'll take a chance on a spotted child. They said, well, we do want to warn you, she'll have terrible self-esteem. And this was the greatest fear of these other families. What would she become as a teenager? I said, we'll take the risk. So I called my husband in Malaysia, and, um, because he was on a business trip. And it was 3 o'clock in the morning there. I had forgotten the time difference. And I said to him, Charles, I said, listen, we have an opportunity to have another four-year-old girl. I said, no problems except that she's spotted. And they offered her to us for half price. So I said, oh, you know, he was tired. Great, great, okay, yeah, yeah, go for it. And that's it, clunk, the phone hung up. I, I had power of attorney, so I rushed down to the immigration office that very next morning and filled out the forms from Abinti Bangura. And then I got a telephone call from my husband. He said, guess what, Pooh, which was his nickname for me, I had the funniest dream last night. I dreamt you called me and told me that we were going to have a second daughter, and she had spots. But when I didn't answer, he said, did you hear me? And she had spots? I said, yeah, she does. He said, you mean this kid exists? I said, yeah. I, I thought, wouldn't it be nice for our other Mabinti to have a sister? He said, okay, okay, that sounds like a good idea. I said, I'll have a chance to sit down and rest once in a while. I won't have to entertain her 24-7. Yeah, okay, go for it. And that is how we ended up with Mia and Michaela, the spotted half-priced child who was going to have terrible issues as a teenager, no self-esteem. What would become of her? And to me, this is a story of serendipity. If it had been, not been snowing that day, I would not have read the newspaper and learned about the war in Sierra Leone. If, it, if I had not come back into the house, I would have driven all the way to school and not known we had a snow day, and I would not have seen that news, newspaper. Well, there's more to this story. I had a son, Michael, who had come to us as a baby with hemophilia, and he's one of the children who died of AIDS. Michael had hair exactly like mine. He was a towhead, and he had nothing at all that, would, that you would think would have anything to do with Africa. But when Michael was little, oh, first of all, let me add, Michael was also deaf, and he loved the computers, and he loved closed captioning on TV, and he loved Africa. I think initially because of the animals, but then eventually because of the people. For years, Michael had said to me, well, he had written it to me or signed it to me, Mama, please adopt a starving child from war-torn Africa. And when you're raising three little boys with AIDS, the farthest thing from your mind is adopting a starving child from war-torn Africa. 
So that too played in my decision to bring Mia and Michaela to the US. Now while all this was happening on that very same January 1999, um, 22 rebels invaded the orphanage. And we all know that the rebels raped women and children, um, amputated arms and legs. Well, eight of the children in that orphanage had been raped by rebels. So when, I, when the, my children arrived, the first time I saw them, actually I went to Africa to get them. Mia, who had been smiling in the picture I saw, was rigid with fear. Every time she would get near a man, her eyes would fill with tears. She was terrified. Michaela, because of her spots, was left alone by the rebels because superstition had it that a child with spots, with vitiligo, um, was a child of the devil and was very unlucky. So these rebels got nowhere near Michaela, but Mia had become their victim. So what do you do with two little girls who are suffering from terrible post-trauma stress disorder? I didn't have a problem with Michaela. She had her own solution because the day I picked her up in Africa, she searched my luggage. And when I didn't understand what she was looking for, she whipped a picture of this ballerina from a 1979 magazine. She showed me, and then she stood on her toes and tiptoed around the room with her hands over her head. And I realized this kid wanted to dance ballet, and I understood that she was looking for point shoes in my bag. Of course, why hadn't I thought to pack point shoes for this four-year-old child? Instead, I had packed sneakers and shorts, and she wanted a tutu and point shoes. So I promised her that she would dance, um, not knowing what she was understanding, but she seemed to understand that I had given her this promise, and she held me to it. Um, as soon as we got to the U.S., that's all she wanted to know. Her first words are, when am I going to dance? And I told her as soon as her English was good enough, she would dance. Because, you know, Michaela was more interested in looking at a Nutcracker video than learning English, whereas Mia was fluent in English in nine days. So this was my bribe to Michaela. So Michaela healed from her years of abuse and, and cruelty through dance. She was able to express her emotions through dance. But when I would watch Mia in the classroom, she would still be rigid and frightened of anyone male who came anywhere near her. And one day, I had taken the girls to a ballet. I think it was Balanchine's Jewels. As a matter of fact, I know it was Balanchine's Jewels. And um, Michaela watched every step that the ballerinas had made. But Mia's eyes were on the orchestra pit the entire time. And when we were done, I said, okay, girls, tell me what you think of this ballet. And Mia, Michaela said to me, well, I saw that before, Mommy. And it was true, she had seen one ballet company perform it. And there was a girl in the second line, who stepped with her right step foot when she was supposed to be stepping with her left foot. And that bothered me. So I knew that Michaela was destined for ballet. And I knew that that's what she was watching. So I turned to Mia and said, okay, and what did you think of it, Mia? She says, well, she says, I liked the man who was sitting with that long black stick with the silver buttons, and he went tweet, and the orchestra all tuned up. I said, oh, that was the oboist. She said, I want one of those. And Mia is an oboist. She has been, um, she was first oboist in the Green Mountain Youth Symphony. 
Mia threw herself into music, and her healing came through music and the people she met, the orchestral directors who were male that she met. She was able to relate to them. But the person who was most instrumental in having Mia emerge from her little cocoon of fear was my son, Teddy. I had this rowdy, wonderful, gorgeous 18-year-old who was a dancer but also a musician. And Teddy would play the piano. And I told him when she first came home, could you play uh, Muffin Man for her? He says, why Muffin Man? I says, well, she likes jewelry. She wanted to wear my wedding band on her thumb the whole way home from Africa. He said, well, what does the Muffin Man have to do with jewelry? I says, well, he lives on Drury Lane. And she thought he lived on Jewelry Lane. So she loves the Muffin Man. So Teddy played the Muffin Man for Mia. And at that time, she, when he would come in the room, she'd scurry up the steps. And every day, he would play more and more music for her, and she'd come down a step each way. Finally, one day, she actually reached the ground floor of the living room. Next day, she moved closer, and one miraculous day, she stood beside him, and he said, do you want to sit? and she plopped down on the bench. He lifted her hand. He said, this is middle C. And that was her first piano lesson. And Mia has played the piano at least, at least two hours a day, often five and six hours a day ever since then. And it was through music, her involvement in orchestra, her involvement in piano, her involvement in singing, the wonderful men that she met when she studied musical theater in New York City. She healed through music. Michaela healed through dancing. And I often think I have six children now from West Africa, all girls. They've all been through terrible trials in Africa. Of those six girls, four of them are gifted. I have a, a 15 year old who is deaf, but who is such an incredible actress, and she signs with such beauty. I have another, a 16 year old who plays the guitar and is a good student. And I wonder if I, if four of my six girls from West Africa, from war torn Africa, could be talented. Of the 310 children orphaned by the war, I'm sorry, 310,000 children, sorry, 310,000 children orphaned by the war in Sierra Leone. Does that mean there are 206,000 of them who are talented? 206. Talented children who have no access to instruments, who have no access to ballet bars and point shoes. And it just breaks my heart so that I, I'm not a rich woman. I mean, you certainly don't get rich writing books. But if I ever won that huge lottery, I would spend it on a, a boatload of instruments and get some teachers out there to these children, not only in Sierra Leone, but around the world, because I think that music is the key to reaching so many children who have been damaged by war, and it certainly has been our experience that it's so. And now, I would like to turn you over to Mia. So I am in the process of writing a book with my mom. And it's not titled, it's not finished, but I'm going to read a part of it to you all. 
Oh gosh, I have snot coming down too. This is so attractive. I'm so sorry, everyone. Oh my gosh. Those are going to be great photos. Okay. As though malnutrition, malaria, disdain, abuse, and neglect were not enough to try our tiny souls. At one o'clock in the morning on January 2nd, 1999, Eight rebel fighters, dressed in military fatigues, stormed the small orphanage where we lived. I had never felt so filled with terror as I was in the inky blackness of that night during the height of the Civil War in Sierra Leone. We children called the members of the Revolutionary United Front devils because they were rebels infused with the evil of devils. They had begun to ravage our beautiful country eight years before. But by the time they had invaded our orphanage, they had sunk to incredibly low levels of depravity, raping women and children, burning huts with whole families inside, chopping off the arms, hands, legs, and feet of innocent people. Some only babies, and cutting open the bellies of pregnant women to gamble on the gender of their newborn infants. What was worse, they often foisted those brutal chores on the children's shoulders. Young boys that they had kidnapped and inducted into their violent militia. When they crashed through our gate that night, two of the devils held the house father of our orphanage separately, naked and at gunpoint, with their flashlights shining in his eyes. Six other rebels rampaged through the orphanage, looting and creating havoc. Eventually they left, but two hours later, a group of 20 more rebels broke into the orphanage and repeated the same process. My name was Mabinti Suma, and I was four years old at the time. Three months later, in a message to our adoption agency in America, the house father documented the small invasion, but he didn't include an account of what had happened that night. This oversight might have been due to the fact that isolated from us by the two devils, he just didn't know what the others were doing to us. Or perhaps he deliberately tried to hide the more lurid details from the adoption agency that had hired him to protect us. Maybe he thought that the American parents who had paid many thousands of dollars to adopt us might not want to receive damaged girls. I have no coher coherent memories of that night. The rebels invaded the orphanage. I now have a few memories altogether of my life in Sierra Leone. Most of what I brought away from my, oh gosh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Most of what I brought away from my homeland were vague and terrifying flashbacks of drugged, laughing, jittering rebels, a pathological fear of camouflage, fabric, a terror of men, and a terrible long-term physical suffering. To cope with my terror of the rebels, I sang, taking my words and the melodies of my songs from my own imagination. I not only comforted myself, but also Mabinti Bagura, my best friend who shared a woven grass sleeping mat with me. At the time, little did I know that one day we would become sisters and change our names to Mia and Michaela. When I met my new American mother, you cannot imagine the joy I felt in the fact that she liked to sing and teach me songs. Then when I met my new brother, he overcame my fears with songs and music. I could not imagine anything more wonderful for a child who loved song than to be gathered in the arms of a family who loved to sing. Last month, I earned my professional certificate in songwriting from Berklee College of Music. I am now currently working on my vocals certificate, and next year I plan on getting my degree. I play several instruments, including the piano. And I see music as not only as a meaning of earning a living, but the, by the means of which I heal myself from the troubles that I have encountered in the past, and any I may be faced with in the future. No amount of therapy could be served, 
could have served me as well as music has and will continue to. So now I'm going to try to sprint over to that piano. Probably walk because I'm still, my eyes are still blurry. I'm going to take these and I'm going to play you guys a song called In the Gloaming. In the darkness, memories come to call. They seek me out and set thoughts roaming. Like ghosts wandering in shadowed halls, they visit only in the glow. That every thoughtless act that entangles my poor heart will strive. With their strings wrapped tightly around each fact, strangling all the joys and hopes in life.
teacher always said, you know, Mia, I would come every week to a lesson and my voice teacher would say, oh yeah, you sound good this week. And every time I was sick and I went to a lesson, he goes, you sound amazing. You need to perform right now. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, when you're sick, you just relate better to the song. I was like, so I was wasting money coming and when I felt healthy. And he goes, I want to see you every time you're sick. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you for listening to our story. And I think my sister will show up somewhere. Hi, Michaela. This is uh, Abraham Kim from the Mansfield Center. How are you? Good, how are you? A little tired. I had a long day of rehearsals. <laughs> well, we thank you for joining us. And uh, we ha heard a wonderful uh, life story from your mother, Elaine, and Mia uh, shared her life with us, and of course, a beautiful song with us. And uh, uh, I know you were listening in on, on uh, the presentation, and I wanted to give you a, a minute or two just to share maybe some thoughts. Uh, uh, something that you would like to share with our audience uh, uh, about your life as well. And uh, so I'll just turn it over to you for a, a minute or two. Okay, uh, well, I'm not going to say much, but, but um, you know, because you can go and buy the book, Taking Flight, uh, co written by uh, me and my mother <laughs> together. Um, but what I want to say that's really, really important is the fact that, you know, my mother and my father, they took these children who could have had a lot of problems. But what they did to help us, you know, forget about those things or to move on and to, you know, have a successful life is they focused on what we wanted to do. They, they knew that I wanted to become a dancer. They knew that Mia wanted to become an artist, like a singer and, um, and also a songwriter and pianist and oboist and so many more instruments. And they just put 110% into that. You know, they knew that we wanted to do this and they wanted us to be the best that we possibly could be. And that's why I'm dancing in Amsterdam now, because of my mother. You know, I don't know if you guys know the story, but um, she sewed a tutu for me. And she found a, a dress from a bridal store, um, from a thrift shop. And it was a bridal dress. And she, she sewed it into a tutu. She dyed it pink and sewed a thousand crystals on it. And I wouldn't have been able to perform in a competition if my mom didn't put 110% into what I wanted to do. And I think that's an amazing thing. And I think that's really important that parents, you know, just family in general, they support what the kids want to do and not try to make us do something else. Because also I was a competitive swimmer and I could have been in the Olympics, but my mom knew how much I loved dancing. And so she didn't force me to continue swimming. I think that's very important. That's it. <laughs> well, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Michaela. Love you. Miss I you. <laughs> I miss you too. <laughs> We want, thank you. We want to spend a few minutes, uh, maybe taking some of your questions that you would like mm -hmm. to ask the De Prince family, and uh, we have a mic right here in the aisle. If you don't, if you have a question, I encourage you to queue behind the mic, uh, and as we uh, await some folks to uh, ask questions, I wanted to ask. Um, I, I did read the book uh, Taking Flight, and uh, there was a, a part in there that said that at some point you were about to meet the actual ballerina that was in that magazine picture. And I'm wondering uh, what that experience was like, uh, and uh, if you can share that with us. Um, well, I had no idea. She and I have been emailing back and forth, Magali. Um, she's, a, she's from the south of France, and also she was a ballet dancer there, and then she danced in Hungary. No, sorry, at Hamburg Ballet, um, Pennsylvania Ballet, ABT, and also um, uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet. But she and I were emailing back and forth. I was explaining to her, oh, I'm coming home for the summer break. I was wondering if we could meet up. And then she was being very vague and saying, well, I don't know if I'll be in France or if I'll be in Seattle. And I was, I was thinking, oh, maybe she doesn't want to meet me. Like, I, I, you know, I mean, she's my idol. She's been inspiring me since I was four years old. And then all of a sudden I do this TV show, UNICEF, and she's there. And I mean, I... I was in complete shock. My best friend and I, were, we just performed and he was crying the whole time, but I didn't cry. I didn't realize what just happened until I got home. And the fact that I met this person who I could have possibly have seen, you know, so many different times, it just, it worked out perfectly. And she and I had dinner the next day and we just chatted for about three hours. We we're at the restaurant just talking and talking. And she's a wonderful person. She's so humble. She's so so amazing and so much like my mom too and I think that's why I, I, I like her so much and you know she's just absolutely wonderful and I'm just so grateful that I, I actually got to meet the person who inspired me to be who I am today. 
Um, I just emailed her actually earlier today because she wished me a happy birthday. Um, my birthday was last week, but she is wonderful. Yeah. Oh, great. Happy birthday. Belated birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Any, any questions from our audience members? Sure, please. Hi, ladies. Thank you for your stories. I love stories. I'm a teacher, a longtime educator, and I was curious about your early schooling years when you came to America. And did you have um, good experiences, bad experiences? Were there other people that were as wonderful to you as what your parents were? So were there, and were there other barriers that you had to overcome? So that, I'm a little curious about your early culturalization to America. Uh, Kayla, you want to go first, or? No, you go. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to be a while. But um, I think, you know, there were no, no teachers that were great as having our parents as teachers. I mean, my mom, when we came over, taught us a lot. And, and I think of the majority of the teaching happened back and forth to ballet classes in the car. The singing, the <laughs> talking, that's when we learned a lot. But um, middle school was rough for me. Um, high school, I was bullied. I had death threats and everything, and I decided to homeschool because the administrator, like, they didn't believe me. They thought I was making it up. And so I had performed a song earlier called Soto is a Gunshot, and it was pretty much like ripping a page out of my diary where I explained my horror, you know, my terror in high school. And my mom, I begged her to homeschool me, and she did. And I think it gave me, it allowed me to express myself through music. And, um, and right now, I'm at Berkeley College of Music, but I won't dare to go to campus. I'm doing it through online because I have so much going on. And, and I just feel like I like being intimate with a teacher, with someone who I you know, look up to, someone who, who's there for me. And I didn't feel like I got that in a classroom setting. And I think it all started with my mom because even though she was raising you know, Michaela and she had her Teddy who was sick at the time, she devoted so much of her time to Michaela and I. And it's kind of like, you know, the older I got, I feel like my brothers might be a little jealous. They're in their 40s. But it's like my mom spent so much time on Michaela and I. She made us dresses. We, we grew up looking like twins. And it was just amazing to have that kind of teacher around. So she is an incredible person. Um, I'd like to add something to this. What Mia liked, especially about homeschooling in high school, is that she was able to cover subject areas because I loved history, I loved um, women's rights, um, s topics such as that. And we covered so much material. She got involved with women in the world through homeschooling. Um, she had a course on women in history. And so M Mia took six history courses, six full year history courses, because she was homeschooled. And she also got to practice her music as many hours as she wanted. So I think she really enjoyed it. Mia, Michaela, on the other hand, was more the very social person. And she loved being in school. But I'm not going to speak for you, tell them, Michaela. Um, I did love being in school just because I've always loved learning. Um, I think I get that from my mom. Um, but now that I'm older, I realized I don't know, I'm, I've, I've grown up a lot and I'm more of a quiet person. I know who I am and I'm not trying to be like somebody else. Because when when whenever I was going to school, to public school, I was always trying to fit in. But now that I know, you know, I don't have to be like everybody else. I can finally accept myself. I'm not the devil's child anymore. I don't have to impress people in order for them to like me. And, you know, I think I learned that once I, you know, left, left school and I started to um, do online school. And my mom helped me a lot. I mean, she is the smartest person I've ever met. You know, the fact that, you know, she could be a lawyer, she does tutu, she cooks, she, she's a superwoman. And um, if, I, if I had somebody else as a mother, I don't think I would be here today. So I think pretty much our, the greatest teacher was our mom. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, great. Wow. Thank you. Amazing, girls. Thank you. <laughs> our, our time is kind of short. Is there a final question? or? Okay, I have one final question, actually, to both of you, Michaela and Mia. And let's start with you, Mia. Um, you know, a lot of today was about you know history and the present, but now you're working for the future and your dreams. So, what do you see yourself doing in about ten years? Um, 
for me, a lot of it is I just I want to be a songwriter. I want to be like Diane Warren and work in the background. I don't like performing. I don't like being out in public. And everyone keeps pushing me. And I've met a lot of incredibly amazing people here who are like, you need to perform. And it's kind of opened me up. But for me, I love working with young girls who have been through, who have been bullied. So I'm, I love being a part of foundations, different things. And actually, one of my future goals is to be work with Born This Way Foundation, which is one that Lady Gaga and her mom started. And um, the Trevor Project about suicides and everything. Because I remember back when I was younger, Phoebe Prince, I don't know if you guys know the story of her in Massachusetts. After I had gotten death threats, I felt I was going to go commit suicide. And I kind of turned my life around. And I feel, you know, if one person can do it, I feel I can inspire other girls. So my main focus in life and what I want to do in the future is work with young girls through my music, through talking. And I think they need someone who is strong, who is outspoken. And I just feel, I mean, I get it from my mom. As a little girl, I just, you know, I never let a guy, you know, stomp all over me. And I feel girls need to learn, you know, that you're the boss. So that's my <laughs> message. And that's what I want to do when I'm older. So it's, I don't want them to have like an attitude, but I want them to know that they can speak up. You know, a guy is a Another person is a human. I mean, what, just because, well, I'm not going to say what a guy has, but that just, doesn't mean that he's, you know, he's in charge. I mean, we're females. We're, we can be just as bossy and just as, you know, you know, loud and powerful. So that's what I want to do, and I want to do it through music. And, and I love that a lot of my songs are ripped out of pages from my diary, and, they, and they're very personal. It's like Taylor Swift, but I don't talk about breakups. But mine are just like, th my songs are so relatable to a lot of girls, and that's what I want to do with my future. Wonderful. How about you, Michaela? Well, I mean, it's the same for me. I want to work with kids, and um, you guys will be the first people to hear this. I'm going to be the new ambassador for War Child here in the Netherlands, and I'm super duper excited about it. Um, it was funny because the other day I went to their office, and we did this exercise that they do with little kids, and for, it kind of brought up things from my past that I thought, you know, I had dealt with. So I feel like, you know, I, I want to reach out to kids and want, I want them to understand that you don't have to hide it away. You can't, you can't, just because you love something, you just focus on that, but you really need to focus on the things that you've been through and to use what you love to conquer those things. And I love teaching. I love young kids and I want to open a school in Sierra Leone, uh, an art school. I used to just want it to be ballet because I was obsessed with ballet. But I think art in general is an amazing thing. Um, it saved me, it saved my sisters, it saved pretty much, I, I feel like most of the people that I know who have been through a lot of things. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much my main goal is just to inspire people and you know to be a good role model and to help people have hope. Great. Mom, we wanna give you the final word. So Elaine? Oh, well, I don't know if I have a final word right now. I'm just <laughs> so thrilled with what my girls are saying and what comes out of them. They're just, I, I'm just, this Get whole it endeavor. Mama. <laughs> Proud mama. <laughs> I think this yeah. serendipity um, has just changed. Every, I, I just am amazed that that one snowy day in January has turned all of our lives around. Everything happens for a reason, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to believe. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, please help me thank uh, the DePrince family for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.